30 years, it's a long time in anyone's business, but the life of the legendary rock band Deep Purple has seen more than its fair share of trials and tribulations. Deep Purple's visits to Australia during their 30-year career haven't always been frequent, but they have been memorable. It was back in 1971 with the Mark II lineup that the group first made the trip, playing four festival dates, which climaxed in the Ramwick Stadium gig, supported by Free and Manfred Mann. It took another festival, this time the legendary 1975 Sunbury Bash, to lure them back, this time with singer David Coverdale and bassist Glenn Hughes. I remember coming over for one huge show, which was the, the Sunbury Festival, and uh, getting to the site a little, a little before we went on, uh, with, uh, with enough daylight there to see uh, the people that were there and the state that they were in, and this mud bowl that uh, was obviously a field a couple of days before. Uh, and with knowledge of what the expense of these sort of shows could be from doing them in the States and then through Europe, I thought the promoter's in real trouble here. Um, anyway, we went on and uh, uh, the mud sort of leapt up and became people, so it, it, all of a sudden it started to look a bit better. Um, and I, I remember that the audience had a really great time and they seemed to uh, uh, forget their, uh, their discomfort. We had a good time, I remember that. We sort of got there just before the sun went down, so we got an impression of the chaos of the uh, that the weather had wreaked on it. Um, I don't think we saw any of the bands before us. Uh, one or two of the guys may have gone there earlier, but uh, I remember getting there just, you know, just before the sun went down, and then just, you know, chilling out backstage and uh, wondering how it was all going to work. You know, uh, when you come away to do basically one show, and you've not been on the road, then you know it's uh, everything uh, becomes a little more. Uh, you become more aware of the pressure on you because you haven't been touring all the time and you have to try and remember all the all the beginnings and all the endings of songs you know um, so for those two or three hours before we went on stage or whatever it was hour and a half I don't know uh, I really just sat in the dressing room had a couple of uh, beverages and uh, just yeah. tried to remember the bits Deep Purple surprised everyone by playing further Australian dates towards the end of 1975, this time with a new guitarist in tow, Tommy Bolan, and one of the largest PAs ever toured by a rock band. When the group reformed in 1984, Australia was chosen for the debut of their first new studio album in over eight years. With the sold out tour and the surprise appearance of none other than George Harrison at one of the Sydney shows, the group's highly successful Australian tour was written up right around the world. The band forged ahead to be the second biggest grossing act in the world for 1985. Unfortunately, the following Purple Tours failed to make it to Australia, and fans in this country missed out on the controversy caused firstly by Ian Gillan's temporary absence, and then by Richie Blackmore's departure from the band. I think everything evolves over the years. In actual fact, there's only one change from what it was in 69, and that's Richie Blackmore left five years ago. And uh, first of all, we had Joe Satriani for a year, and then um, we sat along, Steve Morse became our permanent uh, guitar player. And uh, he was a unanimous choice. I mean, he was the only name that was on everyone's list of paper because we had a little vote. And um, I think everything changes. Um, I came to the conclusion some years ago that the only impediment to our progress was our history. Uh, it's another one of those things because everyone starts talking about what you've done in the past, which is very nice, but you've got to remain progressive for your own sake as much as anything else. Yeah. And uh, I think the audiences respect that. I remember seeing that we've had a very up and down kind of career and um, I think you learn from those things. I remember back in the 70s. One minute everything was going crazy, the next minute you go back on the third visit in a country, maybe it was Germany or something like that, and you notice the response isn't quite the same, the audiences aren't quite as hot as they were earlier in the year, and you think, well, 
it can only be because we're just doing the same songs over and over again and we haven't progressed really so we put some more into it and um, Bob's your uncle you know a couple of years later they're all back again or a different crowd are back and I think what happens is you tend to get complacent sometimes you get tired sometimes you have family problems you know and it is like a family I have two families my musical family and my domestic family and it's true you sometimes you stay together just for the sake of the kids you know it's um, it happens in music too and I think um, that was a big problem with us and um, I, th I saw confidence levels going down um, and when that happens you start playing safe and you don't push yourself to the limits that you really should be which is I think probably one of the key elements to uh, Deep Purple, it was always dangerous um, you never quite knew when we were gonna, how far we could push it and uh, that danger is back now and I think that's why the crowd's a bit sensational By 1995, Deep Purple had shaken themselves down and recruited former Dixie Dregs guitarist Steve Morse for the lineup, which shows no sign of losing steam four years later. The first album that this lineup released was the excellent Perpendicular, which saw the band pushing in all directions with an energy and enthusiasm that promised much for the new lineup. tour since started in Turkey in June last year I think and we played to over a million people so far in, on this tour and uh, they're all very young and they know all the words and it's it's weird very strange I said to my daughter who let all the kids in she said you don't get it dad <laughs> Deep Purple is really cool so yeah, thank you very much Deep Purple have always adopted a policy of non-stop gigging and their albums have defined high progressive rock. Deep Purple in Rock, Fireball, Machine Head and Made in Japan are all albums that have stood the test of time due to an emphasis on volume, a beefy rhythm section, individual virtuosity and brilliant musicianship. Nothing has changed. After the Perpendicular tour, the band took a breather, with both John Lord and Ian Gillan finishing long-promised solo projects, before regrouping in late 1997 to start recording the new studio album Abandon, released in mid-1998. Their songwriting has always placed an emphasis on capturing that live feel. In a rock song, the most important value a word has is the sound of the word. It has to have the right texture, the right percussive value, and it has to be able to be delivered in the rhythm section just as, as part of the band. And uh, so you can sing almost anything as long as it sounds good in a rock song, but you've got to have a good title. And then the fun starts, because then you've got to have a focus. Because if it's got to sound good, you've got to mean it. And if you mean it, you've got to think, well, I've got to have a focus on this somehow. So when we're writing, we always try and have, what is this song about? And even if it's um, a nebulous sort of lyric, even if it's a, um, um, an abstract or avant-garde approach to things, it's saying nothing. Even if the only in value of the lyric is just as a word exercise, r rhymes and things, whatever, we have to have a meaning. 
the song we're just working on right at the moment in the studio halfway through making a new album this is a thing called seventh heaven the band even performed a series of club dates at the famous house of blues in the u.s to preview some of their songs that would later make it onto their next album abandon deliberately going for a powerful and more unified sound this produced a batch of songs which were tailor-made for the stage as the subsequent world tour proved
During November 1998, negotiations commenced to include Australia in the band's world tour, and by January 1999, the rumours had become a reality. The band that defined heavy metal music is Deep Purple. After 30 years, Deep Purple are back with a vengeance. Don't miss Deep Purple Live. For the first time in 20 years, Deep Purple received enormous publicity in Australia with the announcement of the tour. Live and loud for one night only. Tickets on sale from February 8. An MTV broadcast The House of Blues show recorded in January 1998, featuring tracks that have never been seen anywhere else in the world.
expecting people anymore Hear me grieving Lying on the floor Whether I'm drunk or dead I'm really not too sure I'm a blind man
With the rest of the band members heading home for a short break following the South American leg of the tour, Ian Gillen took the opportunity to explore Australia prior to heading out on the publicity circuit. Uh, from Argentina to Australia, I get this bonus of a week or more off here. And so, Coolum, Hyatt Resort, sensational. If you want to do everything that's just laid on a plate for you, it's fantastic. Swimming and golf and... We won't talk about golf, but... Um, and then I went up to Fraser Island and um, okay, stayed at the Kingfisher there. And I have never seen anything like it. I was in... Um, Buenos Aires and someone said they'd just come back from there. You have to go there. This sand island. And I thought, well, it's sand and it's an island. What else can it be? But, I mean, the moment I arrived, the, th the stunning thing was that you're just seeing this, well, what I call jungle. It looks like jungle. And it's very weird because I was watching a program on Cuba the other day and the last beach in the Caribbean is about to be developed and it's going to be a resort. And you just go, oh no, I've seen what's happened to the Cayman Islands, I've seen what's happened to all these places. I couldn't believe this pristine jungle type thing. With just a hint of some tin roofs in there, and it's a real eco type thing, you know. So you go yomping around the trails and go up to, and they have all these lakes which are like called perched lakes, and they're sitting in the top of sand dunes relying on the rainfall. And you come upon this place called Lake Mackenzie, and you come out of the trees and just go, ah, this is aquamarine, uh, beautiful turquoise water, and it's, and it's fresh. You just jump in and you can drink it, which I did, buckets full, it was wonderful. And um, it's just, um, there's not a sign, there's no, there's no um, Coke or beer stands or anything like that, there's no hot dog stands, it's just what every, everyone dreams of finding those places and it's just incredible and then you go through a rainforest there's all these micro um ec ecological systems and they're incredible and everyone drives along the beach and it's over 100 kilometers wrong and i learned all about the dingoes and stuff like that. they've got the purest breed of dingoes in australia and, and uh, they look just like any mischievous dog to me because they were nicking um life jackets out of the boats and popping the inflatable boats just sinking their teeth in and all you hear was this and the things go down and all in all just stuffing as much as I can into this trip and um, you don't get that sort of privilege very often you know you go to the cities and you, and you have to do the promotion and then you do the concerts and then you move on so it's only a chance that you have every now and again to jump into something like that and I was like a, a kid you know just reveling in it and I shall come back definitely if I get a chance bring the family when I get home, I do exactly what my wife tells me to do, and that's the general way of things. Um, there's a list of chores, but in terms of my interests, um, I write by... It, it, it's a love of mine, I write a lot, so I write every day on the road, sometimes 20 pages, and it's, it's not necessarily aimed at doing anything. At any given time, I'm working on two or three different projects. I'm working on a couple of books at the moment, um, or I'm doing things that have really annoyed me during the day or really made me laugh or mm. turned me on, whatever. A subject is like a... It's, it's kind of therapy, I suppose, but it's also um, um, it's a combination between a hobby and a job, I suppose. And also, I like to capture the moment, the humour or the pathos of the moment, so that when I'm flicking through these books, and I've got hundreds of them at home, and I'm looking for inspiration for a song or whatever, mm. I can think... Well, yeah, I've got something related to that at some stage or another, and it may just be the name of a town to give it colour, or it may be the name of a person, or the mannerisms of somebody, just to give it that, um, you, that you're there at the moment, and it, to bring the whole thing alive. And I find it easier to write it down. I learned it in school. If you write something down, you tend to remember it, and it tends to come alive. Otherwise, it's just some guy told you this. But if you look in your book, it wasn't just some guy that told you this. It was some guy that came into a bar, bought you a drink, and within 15 minutes you know his whole life story. That's how Ted the Mechanic came about. A guy, and it wasn't based in a strip club, it was basically based in a bar in Vermont. But that doesn't matter. The essence of the whole thing is that this guy was lonely and he wanted to talk. And just wanted, and he, his ticket was a beer, you know. And I'm going, yeah, I was actually trying to write something else down. And I wrote this whole life story down on the back of about 10 napkins. And that, was, that fell out of one of my books when I was repacking after I moved home. Stop off from time to time with the strip joint Where a man is a high 
a chair It's easy to say now, um, with five, five years or so with Steve Morse in the band, but my God, what a difference he made. I mean, there were two or three elements that are vital. Um, we look back on the Richie Blackmore period, because we've had time to recover from it, mostly with affection. We've, we've forgotten most of the, the garbage that went on, and uh, we, you tend to look on the bright side, the positive side, that's what we remember. But Purple was going downhill, it was in a nosedive approaching terminal velocity, and there was no future in it. Then Richie left and we had Joe Satriani for a year and then unanimously he was the only name on everyone's list. Steve Morse came into the band. His only question was, is there a dress code? Well, no, come on. And we had a few rehearsals and did some shows in Mexico and we've been in love ever since. And he's brought into the band um, his, not only his personality and enthusiasm and he's, he's uh, I think, verging on as eccentric as the rest of us because you do develop an eccentricity in, in this business. Um, but he's a charming guy, he's, he's a sweet, kind person and uh, he is very well focused. And he's different and he's American and his roots are different, his roots are in bluegrass and jazz and rock and roll, um, which is a, a perspective that none of us had. Um, and he's given us the ability to be a family again. Once that family thing re-emerges, I've spotted in the performance and the attitude of everyone else in the band, first of all, everyone's relaxed because all the tension's gone. And contrary to the theory that one or two people had, um, it doesn't produce good music. It produces awful music, that constant tension. Um, I think it was just a miracle that any music at all came out of it. But, um, and that tension didn't exist in the early days when the best stuff was done. Every song needs the familiarity um, of repetition two or three times. That's what makes hit records on the radio, I think, is you know, you hear something two or three times, it has to be a good song, obviously, or has that commercial appeal. But then um, you need to hear it two or three times till it becomes an old friend. So what we do is we pick, we strike a balance, I think, and pick two or three. We started off with five on a band, but we whittled it down slightly. Um, songs and you you place them with their older brothers and sisters so that they're sort of walking confidently and you're not demanding too much of the audience so that they've just got to listen to a whole string of stuff that they're not familiar with because that's hard work. If we have ambition to have our music heard and spread um, through radio, television as it is now, and magazines and other forms of media. You need the business. You need the goodwill of the business as much as anything else. So you grow up learning that side of it as second nature and you grow up making friends with people. The vast majority of people in the business are decent people. Um, but it's the invisible policy makers, as usual, behind the scenes, that throw these people onto the streets. I know so many people who have given their lives to the music business, great people, starting off as label managers or in the marketing side, promotion side, um, A&R people, um, publishing people, whatever. And then all of a sudden, because of some policy change, dumped. I remember Joe Satriani phoning me saying his record label has just dumped him overnight. He was in the middle of a world tour, all sold out. He was in England playing at Wembley. And he called me, it was, he was devastated. They've just decided it's going to be an all rap label now. And go talk to Sony, go talk to um, whatever. So I refer to the music business, um, having explained how I feel about it, as Moronica. And that was our little thing in a song on Abandon called Any Fool Know That. And there's a thing that goes, oh, Moronica, Queen of the Biz, and a friend, Flash Harry, think he knows what it is. Tin Pan Alley, Fat Head Larry. Don't know shit, just trying to keep her happy. And of course, in America, they banned the word shit. Um, I don't swear very often, but it was p perfectly in context. And so on the record, they computerized it, so it came out as <laughs> something like that. And it's now affectionately known as the no shit version. <laughs> but uh, the business is um, complex and very powerful. Wow, there you are. Thank you. How you doing? Thank you. I thank you.
Great to see you again. How are you? Fantastic. Superb, superb. Thank you very much. We're going to do a, a sort of bunch of things tonight, most of which you'll know, and uh, some of which we'll know. This is a thing from uh, recently re recorded from an, uh, Deep Purple in Rock, dedicated to the management. behind all of this, the puppeteers. And it's all about big money. If I tell you Deep Purple is created for the record industry, this is nothing to do with any concerts we've done, one billion pounds worth of sales of, of, of over the counter. Mm. I don't know what that is in dollars, but that's a lot. One billion, a thousand million pounds worth of retail. Um, and a very tiny proportion of it has come our way. Um, an extremely tiny proportion of it has come our way. And I think that um, along those lines, we're not bitter or anything like that. But I'm just trying to illustrate why we have to have that suspicion, and I think it's a healthy one. I think it's good for us. So I don't, and I, I trust promoters, even the crooks. I trust them because they put their money where their mouth is and they take a risk. And they're going to take a tumble. They're going to sell tickets, and they, they're shrewd. They know whether they're going to, most of them know how much business they're going to do. Some of them, they're a little surprised when it fails. Some of them are a little surprised when it's more successful. But that's a wee bonus. Um, but at least you know who you're dealing with face to face, money on the table, bang, do your job. And that's the great thing with um, the, the response. You can tell when things are going well. And you can tell when there's a reaction. And that makes you sit down and think, damn, we've got to make a damn good record because things are going well. We've really got to focus on this. Not that we've got a clue about commerciality.
me I wed her in a hurry No more callers and I float with pride What? I'm dreaming I feel like screaming I want my woman just before she died I want you, I need you, got you special guests Roger Glover and Ian Gillen from Deep Purple. Were the days as wild as we all hoped they were? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think uh, we didn't think they were wild at the time but I mean we were unleashed really. As I said when you're that age you, you're immortal anyway. You think you're immortal. Um, and you have a certain power if you like. You're f free financially. You can you can do an awful lot of things, but you also have this amazing confidence, and I mean, it, it, it crosses over into many aspects of life, not only musical, but into your behaviour patterns as well, and you don't realise sometimes, you, it takes a little while to grow up, I mean, you, you do behave like cretins at times, at times, I did, certainly, many times, did every you day. Run? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, so I was a fairly shy teenager, and joining a band, uh, I think Ian said the right word. It empowers you. You have a certain power. You're in the band. And if you're in the band, That's it. you can pretty much do anything you want because there are people there to protect you, to get you out of any mess you get into. Did you on. abuse the power? Probably. Not knowingly, but probably, yeah. Yeah, I think it was... I don't think there was any unkindness. Uh, let's put it that way. I don't think there was any, anything other than, wow, you know, like a running loose in a chocolate factory. I think that's basically what it was. I mean, there were, no, I think I just fell in love a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Quite meaningfully. Yeah. We were talking about those uh, yeah. delayed guitar solos. Extended guitar solos. Yeah, extend, yes. <laughs> extended. You didn't, um, you didn't particularly mind if the guitar solo went on for, for a while. 
Not always, no. There was always something to do. I mean, it was... Something <laughs> to do. <laughs> I know what you were getting at. <laughs> it, well, I just have to ask you, this, the story, the legend is yeah. that during one of those lengthy uh, guitar mm. solos of mm. Richie's that you clambered under a Steinway, and I, I suppose there just happened to be a woman there. Well, <laughs> just, no, I, I, there I guess actually. they just lay around under Steinway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, littered with them. <laughs> Interesting, <laughs> interesting thought. But uh, in fact, I remember this thing being on the stage because we weren't allowed to remove it. It was the it was the theatre Steinway. Don't the girl or the piano? Yeah, there was a fix. It was a fixture, and they, they had a, this green canvas cloth over it that was so far from the ground. And um, the solo looked as if it was one of those nights you couldn't quite tell how long it was going to be. So I thought I better not go down the pub that night. Um, and um, <laughs> so uh, there was a girl standing on the side of the stage. So we um, left under the Steinway, and um, I think um, that I, I, it was a very nice solo. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, <laughs> so it's true. What you're telling me is, is true. Yeah, 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 it's, it's all true. Yeah. I never heard uh, with you blokes much about drugs. Heard an awful lot about booze. What yeah. about drugs? Did you yeah. get them? We were pretty much a drug-free band. Um, Pretty I much. Know. We were totally drug free actually yeah. in those days. Well, I was known as a stinking hippie because I'd actually had a joint. <laughs> oh, you'd had a joint, yeah, that's right. Uh, but no, we were a drinking band. Uh, yeah, and the, my favourite drink was you know, a bottle of a uh, can of Coke, pour a little, half of it out and fill it up with scotch. That's what we used to do. We weren't allowed to take alcohol in the, a lot of the clubs in the early days, so we used to take this scotch and Coke. That's how it became a musician's drink because it just looked like a bottle of Coke, but it would really be <laughs> a, a scotch and Coke. So, did you spend quite a lot of time on stage drunk? Actually, no. Um, you can't really play very well when you're drunk. Mm. Uh, more, more importantly, you can't hear very much. when you, I've been on stage drunk, and you can hear everything, but you can't hear it in balance. So you've got no really clue what's going on. But you'd have a little bit of, you know, a certain amount just to loosen up to get on stage. But the real drinking always took place afterwards. We, we developed a great tolerance to alcohol, and we, we, we were very rarely drunk. We, we just drank a lot, and uh, I, there's a big difference. By the sound of it, to sit here and talk about it now and laugh about it now, because you both have a sense of humour about it, which is terrific, it all sounds like it was up all the time. Mm. But did you ever get moments of depression? Oh, yeah. yeah about so, what? Yeah. I remember once going, um, going nuts. We were on one of these endless American tours where you play five or six nights a week, different place every night um, and for months on end and uh, I think I had a bit of a nervous breakdown I just went crazy one night uh, I said something and no one listened to me and I lost my temper put my fist through a window and I, I think I was going through something then I was pretty depressed about it what about you Ian well I <clears throat> yeah I I quit the business in 73 I decided I'd had enough and I left the band um, after giving them nine months notice and I just quit totally and uh, I had a recording studio, well not totally because I had a recording studio in London so I was involved on the periphery with semi-productions and things like that but really wasn't that interested in it and I got involved in motorbikes and other things and uh, didn't even think about it until Rog invited me to the Royal Albert Hall, he was doing a production of the Butterfly Ball which he'd written and somebody hadn't turned up for one of the parts so he phoned me the, I think the day or two before and said, can you help me out, mate? Yeah, no problem. So I went along in my suit and my short hair. And Vincent you didn't, Price didn't was... didn't recognise you. Uh, <laughs> he well, did, actually. He walked on stage and the, the place erupted. Yeah, they it, was, it was a great welcome. I moment. didn't know what was going on. I thought uh, <laughs> Vincent Price was narrating from the organ loft in this great peacock chair, I remember. And uh, we were talking in the bar afterwards and he said, I didn't know what was happening. I said, well, I didn't know what was happening either. I said, it was just amazing. And he said, it was for you. And I said, I know. I, I was very emotional. And uh, I suddenly realized it was the stupidest thing I've ever done. You know, I've got this thing all wrong. I think, you know, just because I can't imagine that I could achieve any more success <clears throat> or achieve anything more musically than uh, I have with Deep Purple. Um, that doesn't mean to say I can't enjoy music. And uh, so I wrote four songs the next day and uh, put myself in the studio and um, 
very clumsily got back into the business, um, tripping over all the way, but not knowing, not following any of the rules, rebelling and um, not wanting to fit in. I didn't. I, there's something had happened inside me during those early years with Purple that turned me into a rebel forever. Um, Are you still? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. How does your family handle that? Oh, I'm a pussycat when I get home, you know. I mean, that's not a problem in that sense. I, I mean, I mus <laughs> musical rebel. I mean, I mean against the business and that sort of thing. Um, if people say black, I say white, whatever. And I don't mean it harmfully, and I'm a good team player. If we're all sort of kind of, we take a vote in this band on anything, and uh, if one person says they don't want to do it, we don't do it. Well, he told me of those injustices that he had suffered in his life, his wife and kids and boss and dogs, neighbors raising cane and causing strife. They were forever whining, bleating, howling, yapping, screeching, moaning, crying. He fed them well. He kept them warm. Welcome back. Well, time for this week's footy tips. And if you're any sort of punter, probably the best tip I can give you is not to follow Jars. Our fearless footy clown only managed three winners last week. So this week he's turned to the doyens of 70s rock to see if they can pound some serious footy sense into his head. Now, they didn't come much bigger or much louder than Deep Purple. And this week, bass player Roger Glover put a hold on the smoke on the water to pick some winners on the oval. I'm on a psychedelic trip rock fans and football fans. Oh, I'm living in the 70s. I'm flying higher than Cocker and Hendrix and Modra. Oh, and there's no mistake in this sound. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, baby, we're rocking with Deep Purple. I'm going to catch up with co-founder Roger Glover very shortly for his footy tips. And what a black night last weekend. The Wiz and me got three, and the prof, he fluked a four. Now let's rock and roll to Deep Purple. Roger Glover Painful. Deep Painful. Purple, how are you mate? How Andrew Jarman. Pleased to meet you Andrew. What do you reckon? Uh, it's a guitar. <laughs> have I got potential? Um, potential is not the word I would have used, oh. uh, but we can use that one if you like. You've got potential, but I'm not sure what for. <laughs> now Roger, you guys are legends in the 60s and 70s, and, and, and no doubt the 90s, but why does every young kid get a guitar and try and play Smoke on the Water? What is it? Well, the key to that, to that song, I think, is that it's simple. But not only simple, but it's strong, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to be simple and, and silly, but that's one of those strange riffs yeah. that Richie came up with, that it defies logic, what, you know, it's like da-da-da-da, yeah. what makes that so great, you know, it's, it's what he did with it. Oh, it's amazing. Mate, have you ever seen a game of Aussie Rules? Yes, I have, as a matter of fact. And what I are watched, your thoughts I on that? I watched it last. It was a bit like watching The Prisoner from the old days, you know, The Prisoner, yeah. <laughs> you try to figure out what was going on, you know. <laughs> That's Australian rules football. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't? No. Roger, football teams and players, they have superstitions. Uh, a lot of blokes put their left boot on first and put their Saint old jocks on. What about you blokes? Are Actually, you... yeah, we do have a little, we have a ritual. Yeah. We have a little ritual. Just, yeah. before, we, just before the lights go down, yeah. we all stand in a little circle and shake each other's hands and, yeah, say, really? and say, Kumbaya. Kumbaya. A 
feature of the tour was the appearance of the band on Australia's premier live entertainment show, Hey Hey It's Saturday. Well, that'll take till Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah, you and I should just keep playing and let them change to get to where the guitars are coming from. So you and I play the thing. <coughs> the guitarists can have fun. Or not. No, it's as far as who's there. Six times through the riff. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, right. Then it's first verse of the chorus, yeah. and twice through the riff. Yeah. So verse you don't make the bass come in? No, oh, yeah, yeah. There's no solo. So they kind of set up now. Roger and I are playing unless, the way we Unless, of course, you tell me you want one, and then uh, I'll go tell them that's only we'll do it. <laughs> they're cool. They're, you know, they're saying whatever it takes to get this done, whatever you guys want to do, they'll find it. No, I'm not. I'm not that way. You know that. <laughs> what, you, uh, sorry, you're not that way. Yeah, <laughs> that's I know. Right. Yeah, yeah, we have to be that We way. know that. Yeah. <laughs> I am. I, I think. Well, I, I, I think that... I think I, we the just play a long version of the riffs and let them come in and go yeah, out, yeah. as they will. You and I play it like it's... Yeah. If there was a time yeah. to make a stand, it would be, well, there's got to be two old catalog songs. That would be... Yeah. Oh. That would be the issue to me. Second verse chorus. I tried that. Yeah. <laughs> Is that right? I guess it's because there's not so much, you know, there's no, no, yeah. not going through the mind here so much, you know, it's just from that. It's not going through the lessons. Oh, yeah, now yeah. we've got something. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Charlie, is there a sort of a, a large person who goes under the pseudonym of giant haystacks around? Is this something I can get? It's coffee, tea. It's a coffee. It's a coffee. A coffee? Giant. Uh, with a little milk and a one sugar. Thank you, Charlie. Yeah. on Hey Hey It's Saturday, the band were able to meet many of their Australian fans and aspiring musicians. Hi guys, fantastic. Bloody great. As well as their appearance on the show Hey Hey It's Saturday, the band members also took part in numerous radio interviews. Well, there's some things that men do that boys can't. <laughs> that, Roger, is there a trick to the reason why Deep Purple survives for such a long time? Is there something about... We did a deal with the devil a long time ago. <laughs> 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 is, there some, is there any reason there's, why you... I think, I don't know, there's a spirit to this band that just refuses to die even though it's been uh, put down a few times. And that spirit really is, is born out of the music. It's the music that keeps it alive. Deep Herb was never a band that was an image band or anything like that. It was just really a, a, a bunch of musicians. It was a musician's band. And I think that's the... Uh, there's a certain honesty to that that, oh. that that gives it a longevity. What happened between mid, mid... It is a great word, longevity. <laughs> mid-70s mid to mid-80s guys took a break what was all that about oh i can't remember that <laughs> <laughs> okay well i'm going to ask you about the new album abandon um did you fiddle with any of the songs much fiddle yeah, oh, yeah. yeah there was lots of fiddling going on, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no i'm a huge fan um basically when i was little i, I learned <clears> the flute but i had a lot of people around me who was, were learning guitar and if they could do the riff off smoke on the water that was just like the coolest that was Huge. Yes, that's one of those riffs, isn't it? Do you get sick of playing it? Do you get sick of people talking about it? Never. I mean, the only just getting sick. I mean, who am I to complain? Really, it's every now and again, it's, it's a little irritating when that's the only thing people know of you. Yeah. Uh, when there is, you know, so much rich tapestry of life going on behind the scenes. Now, Steve, for you was it just a case of when you replaced Richie Blackmore? Is that being in the right place at the right time? I'm not sure. I think. Um, <coughs> I was in the same place for the last 30 years, but 
it, it, actually maybe it was because Roger, while he was in Florida recording, um, which album? Perfect Strangers. It was um, no, it was uh, Slaves and Masters. Slaves and Masters. He, he heard my band play, and also just as luck would have it, the one, <clears throat> the one place you know, England, where they really hated the, the dregs, the critics. <laughs> They, they were using it as a background for a BBC show for 15 years. <laughs> so, so the guys sort of uh, had heard, heard me in little snippets. And um, anyway, because of that, when Roger suggested it, they said, hey, let's give it a try. You know, and that, the idea being that they, they said, well, we want somebody to replace him that's going to be different than Richie. And, and I was impressed with the fact that they would even consider somebody like me. You know, it's, have you ever heard the joke where I would never go to a club that would have me as a member? Or something, you know. You, maybe you haven't heard that. <laughs> 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 we might go down that road. We're going to wrap up the lines 1300 36 1051. If you'd like to chat to the guys from Deep Purple, give us a buzz right now. Now, just quickly, um, you've been on a, a, a basically a 30th anniversary world tour. You've been to Moscow, Europe, everywhere. What are the fans going to get tonight at Melbourne Park? Well, it's not actually a 30th anniversary. That's the record company celebrating that. We're just carrying on as normal. This is <laughs> this is just a regular album, regular tour. You know, it's. Uh, what can they expect, Roger big. and Steve? What, what can they expect, the Melbourne people? Uh, oral fireworks. Oh. Fireworks? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Sounds great. one three hundred thirty six one zero five one. We're talking to Roger Glover and Steve Morse, the boys from Deep Purple. You can chat to them next on the Grill Team. Here's some classic Deep Purple. <laughs> Just speaking of it, fellas. Smoke on the water on Triple M. Melbourne's Rock 105, Triple M, some classic Deep Purple. You're with the Grill Team, and we're talking to the guys from Deep Purple, Roger Glover and Steve Morse. We've opened up the phones. Kevin from Kingsbury joins us. How are you doing, Kev? Hey, buddy. How are you doing, mate? Oh, very good. What do you want to ask the guys? Um, I wanted to know what uh, Tommy Byron was like as a guitarist, because I've got a lot of his, well, his uh, two albums that he produced by himself. <coughs> I just want to have their opinion of him. Well, uh, actually, neither of us ever worked with him in a band. I met him a couple of times, and he was a very nice chap. Um, and uh, I think as a guitarist, he was extremely exciting, but mostly because uh, he didn't really know what he was doing. He was an instinctive <laughs> guitarist. I remember John telling me once, he said, no, you've got to start on the second beat of the bar. And he said, what's a bar? <laughs> <laughs> but but for, having, having said that, he's you know, extremely inventive and very original. Beautifully put. Let's try Darren from Mill Park. How are you doing, Darren? G'day, mate. How are you going? Oh, very good. What do you want to ask the fellas? I just want to ask the guys about their relation with uh, Black Sabbath during the 70s as a uh, fellow pioneer band of heavy metal, I guess. Uh, who? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Uh, actually, uh, I think we met them once or twice, but it was it was never a close relationship in the 70s. We were all too busy on our own careers to actually sort of hang around and get together. Uh, it's taken uh, this many years. We're, we're actually much better friends now than we ever were then. But you should add that the part about Ian working with them. Well, yeah, Ian actually spent uh, a year. It sounds like a prison to him. <laughs> spent a year in Black Sabbath, um, which he uh, recalls with actually a lot of fondness and affection. Uh, they're good, but they're good guys. Wonderful. And we've also got Mick from Parkdale on the line. G'day, Mick. How are you? Hello, Mick. Hey, Mick. Not there. We'll try Paul from Berwick. How are you doing, Paul? <clears throat> Mason, how are you, mate? Oh, very good, mate. You big Deep Purple fan? Uh, mate, Roger Glover is the main reason I took up playing bass. He's a legend, and I'm shaken. And uh, hope you get a big head over that, Rog. Well, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's been a long time since '84. Glad you're back. Uh, you're going to have that Rick and Backer on stage? I'm afraid not. No, oh, I've mate, still, I've still got it, but yeah. it just doesn't sound very good these days. There's one other question, Roger. On come hell or high mm. water. The brand of bass you were playing, I just couldn't get a snippet. I think Blackmore throwing too much water around the place um, made it hard to see. I think I used it, a tune bass. Tune? Yeah, I think then. I can't remember what else I used, but it certainly was a tune. Okay. And there was just one other thing, Roger. Um, the Mark II um, sound is obviously, you know, the most famous, the best, and Steve definitely enhances your sound. Uh, do you do any of the Mark III songs in particular, uh, say something like Burn or Mistreated? Uh, do they ever come into your repertoire at all? No. No, uh, yeah. It's, it's really, I suppose it's a, it's a difficult one because people like different areas of this band, eras of this band. Um, but, you know, we kind of prefer to, the, to play the ones that we actually performed on, especially Ian Gillan's point of view. 
Mick certainly, uh, oh, sorry, Paul certainly sounds like he uh, knows Paul a little bit about I you think guys. Paul will be there tonight. He's yeah, a moral be to be tonight. there and he's a pretty keen guitarist. Hey, um, have you got a worst memory ever on tour? You've probably got a lot of great memories. What would be one of your worst memories? This is rapidly going towards Oh, we're not that close yet, are we? (laughs) I want to know, do you guys, how much does it take to get psyched now? I mean, do you just sit around and have a few drinks before you go on? Or what's actually going to be the process tonight before you hit stage? I've always loved playing guitar. You know, even if it's a room with just a bass player and drummer, with no one there. But I've always loved interacting with other musicians, getting this energy that is greater than the sum of the parts going then you add an audience that wants to hear what you're playing and you've got an explosion of just really positive energy that i i think everybody just is jumping on the bit to, to get out there and do it and the title of uh, of the new cd abandoned is that whose idea was that and is that getting away from perhaps i don't know the heaviest stuff of the early days or how different is it, how different is abandoned for uh, for today's fans the music or the title? Both. Well, the title was really, it was Ian Gillan's suggestion, and it was really because there was nothing much else hanging around. So well, came there were some others. <laughs> <there> was, <laughs> do we have dissension in this band? Yes. 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 <laughs> now, now, Roger, 50 countries you've been to over a long period. Yeah. In AFL football, we have groupies. Which country's got the greatest groupies? Oh, duck. <laughs> or the best girls or the nice girls? Not married, of course, eh, Roger? It used to be... Um, Houston. Houston? Texas, yeah. That was the groupie capital of America. Were they good down there? Back in the 70s. Cool. There were just so many of them. (laughs) (laughs) This perhaps might be a road we don't want to go down on tipping. I'm I'm talking back in the 18th century, of course. (laughs) We'll talk about it later, Roger. It's going to be a sensational (laughs) concert, Deep Purple, at Melbourne Park tonight. There's still a few... With the live recording of the Melbourne Park show, this Australian tour will no doubt be remembered and enjoyed by fans all over the world for many years to come. Where are you? 